What is up, Pitt fans? Thank you so much for tuning in to Inside the Panthers on YouTube. My name is Steven Thompson. Here alongside my partner, Jack Markowski. I'm at the Peterson Event Center where the Pitt Panthers just knocked off uh, Florida State by a final score of 88-73. It was an ugly game, uh, not a very aesthetically pleasing basketball contest, but the Panthers leave as 15-point winners. Uh, that certainly won't hurt the net rankings. They are now 20-10 and 10 overall. They're 11-8 and 8 in ACC play. They are... Within striking distance of a double buy in the ACC tournament, uh, you know, after a couple losses here and there, the Panthers still kind of have emerged and, and gotten down to the home stretch playing some of their best basketball of the year. Uh, they look to be in a good position heading into the NCAA tournament, or excuse me, the ACC tournament, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. Uh, but they do still have one more game left to left to play in the regular season. They'll host NC State this weekend, but. As far as this game against Florida State goes, it was another Blake Hinson show. Uh, he scored 27 points, made six threes, six of 11 from three-point range, grabbed a few rebounds here as well. Obviously, the scoring stands out, but uh, you look at what Blake Hinson has done, particularly this year, uh, and some of this stuff has accumulated over his two seasons with the Panthers, but uh, just some of the records that he holds now. He set uh, the single-season three-point record uh, tonight. Uh, he passed Ashton Gibbs who set the uh, the single-season record back in 2011. He made 102. Blake Hinson now has 104. Uh, he set the single-game record uh, for three-point shooting by a Pitt Panther. Uh, he holds the Peterson Event Center record for scoring by a Pitt player. Uh, and he climbed from 42nd to 37th on the Pitt all-time scoring list uh, with this game. In this performance, he passed five guys with just one game. Um, and he's done this all... Uh, in just two seasons, not even two full seasons, uh, because there's still a way to go towards the end of the season. Um, the the numbers are incredible, um, and, and the records are incredible. But he has also contributed to so much winning. Um, like we talked about, uh, you know, twenty and ten, an overall record. Now the Panthers have won uh, twenty or more games in back to back seasons. The first time that's been done in over a decade. And Blake Hinson has been the leading scorer on both of those teams. Uh, Jack, what do you make of? where Hinson stands in, in pit history right now. I mean, we, we started to talk about this a little bit uh, earlier in the season, but what does what do you make of Hinson's legacy and the legacy that he's leaving behind as he hits the home stretch of his time uh, as a pit Panther and gets ready to play his last home game in the Peterson Event Center this weekend? Yeah, it's been a long time since Pitt has had a player of his magnitude. Uh, you know, I think it's undeniable that he's had one of the better stretches or two season stretches of any Pitt player ever. Uh, I mean, he's just an absolute force to be reckoned with. He embodies the modern game and he's the heartbeat of this team. And I think that might be the most important uh, quality. I mean, he's the connective tissue. Uh, you know, he's the heartbeat. Um, he was a major part of the team's turnaround last year. You know, he was a part of that transfer group. Uh, that came in and really changed the narrative surrounding the program, um, which I do ultimately think will be his legacy. Uh, he means so much to this program now and in the future with the foundation that he's laid. Um, and he's embraced every part of being a Panther, uh, you know, playing at the Pete, the Oakland Zoo, all of that. And uh, this is looking ahead a little bit, but I think if he can help Will Pitt to two consecutive tournament appearances for the first time in a decade, uh, that just builds up his legacy even more. He's been super consistent. He's put up otherworldly numbers, uh, like you talked about with all the records that he holds. Um, and I think he will go down as a pit legend. And I, I think, honestly, he's already cemented himself as that. Uh, the career totals aren't going to rank super high just because he's only been with the program for two years. But that's not important in this case, I don't think. Uh, he's made such a mark on this team. And you hear this every so often, too. But I think it's especially true in this case. Uh, there will never be another Blake Henson for so many reasons. Uh, such a unique player who provides so much to this team on and off the court um, as someone that will go down in history here and will be sorely missed uh, next year and beyond. Yeah, I think you you make a great point uh, that his impact, uh, and I think when I say impact, I think I don't just mean, you know, kind of on the court. I mean, the wins are awesome. The, all the records and the threes that he's made are awesome, but you touch on a good, uh, on a good thing, which is his kind of emotional impact. Um, this was a team, this was a program, this was a fan base that was so down on themselves. Uh, and for good reason, you know, they had lost a ton, taken their lumps. This this was a proud program that had been taken to the depths of the Power Five, to the depths of college basketball. And when Blake Hinson arrived, he didn't really have his confidence. Uh, it had to be given to him. Jeff Capel had to trust him. He had to give him that confidence. Uh, 
and that trust had to go both ways. You know, uh, Blakinson had to trust that Jeff Capel was, you know, had his best interests at heart. Um, and that mutual, that shared relationship, that shared trust uh, has blossomed into Blake becoming the the confident, bodacious uh, guy that we know him as, the confident player that we know him as. He has given this, like I said, this fan base, this program, uh, this team, a, a kind of swagger that it didn't have before he got here. Um, and I don't think it would have had, even if he wasn't on that team last year, which would have been pretty good without him, uh, I think he gave them a swagger that was, was really critical. Um, he's a leader this year, and he has instilled that uh, in the younger guys as well. It, it is really hard to overstate uh, just how much the the emotional impact has played a role in, in what Pitt has done over these past two seasons. He is he's special in more ways than one. He is special as a player, but also special as, I think, a person, as a leader, um, as a representative of this program. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why he's going to get remembered for a long time, long after he leaves this gym long after he plays his last game in the Peterson event center, because, you know, he is so magnetic. He has, he has gravity to him. Um, he, people appreciate him. He, he is charismatic. He is funny. He gives good quotes. He, he, he balances this all while also being all about business, all about winning. Um, it, it is, it is interesting to see someone who is so outlandish, but also, uh, you know, is not considered to be a diva or not considered to be distracted, uh, a distraction or distracting. Uh, he is, I think, everything that you would want in a leader and in a player, uh, in a guy that is fun to watch in college basketball. I, he embraces the modern game, not just in the way that he shoots and the kind of shots that he takes and the way that he plays, but I think uh, in the emotion that he plays with too, he really leads this team from a place of, like I said, swagger and, and energy and confidence uh, that I think is so critical, especially when you consider these past two seasons, it hasn't always been sunshine and rainbows. You know, they've won 20 games in back-to-back -back seasons, but there have been plenty of times where uh, whether this team was good or not was in doubt. Uh, they were in low places before, and I don't think without Blake Henson's confidence and his swagger and his magnetism that Pitt pulls himself out of those spots. Speaking of the game specifically, uh, it, it was a little ugly at certain times. I mean, Pitt did the best that they they possibly really could against uh, a Florida State team that it was pretty clear was trying to muck things up, was trying to speed up Pitt's guards, be physical with them, uh, force a lot of turnovers, and and just drag this game into a messy place. And it got to a messy place. I mean, 26 fouls uh, between the two teams. I'm looking for the turnover numbers. I mean, uh, 23 turnovers between the, the two teams. Uh, it was... Not the most, no, not the prettiest game in the world. Pitt still walks away as 15 point winners, though. Uh, and to be honest, physicality, um, pressure, uh, that had been stuff that had been kind of Pitt's Achilles heel in the past. What did you make of how they handled pressure and physicality in this game? And does it say what does it say about the way this team has grown up over the season? Yeah, I think they sort of had to win ugly, and I mean that in the best way possible. It's not something that they've always done, but it was a physical game, a lot of sloppiness, I thought, and that tone was set from the very beginning uh, with Bob Carrington and Jameer Watkins getting those double technicals. Um, Florida State sort of used full court pressure from the beginning at different points, and I thought Pitt handled it pretty well. Um, you know, and that's sort of the seminal style. They're not a three-point shooting team. They're not a jump shooting team. Uh, they don't have guys that are necessarily going to create their own shot. You know, their offense, when it's going right, like it was at different points throughout the night, you know, they're driving to the rim, they're drawing contact, they're getting to the line, they're feeding their big men down low. Um, and Pitt did have trouble uh, at certain points, especially in the second half, the middle part of the second half in particular. Uh, they did commit 11 turnovers, 20 fouls, but they answered the bell. Uh, and I think you have to give a lot of credit to them. I think a big part of that was the boards. They did tie with Florida State, but still they had nine offensive rebounds, 12 second chance points. Um, they forced 12 turnovers themselves. They only allowed 28 points in the paint. They had five blocks. Um, and on the other end, the Panthers had 40 points in the paint, which I, that's one of the higher totals that I can remember personally. In any game this year, there were 16 of 20 on layups and dunks. Um, that level of conversion just isn't typical especially for Pitt it's not really their style of scoring uh, but they were super effective in that manner tonight um, against a pretty lengthy and tough Florida State defense um, and Pitt didn't shy away from the contact you know I think it's they could have backed down 
they could have let Florida State sort of impose their will, but they didn't. They didn't let it affect them or the way they played defensively, even though though they did commit a lot of fouls. Um, you know, and I think because they sort of stayed within themselves, uh, you know, and were able to continue scoring, finding ways around FSU's physicality, um, it got to a point where they forced the Seminoles to have to beat them from the perimeter. They made them play their game instead of Florida State making Pitt play their game. Um, so, yeah, I think Pitt stood their ground. They matched that physicality. It gave them a leg up uh, and helped them thwart the Seminoles' comeback efforts, too, in the second half. And I think this is the kind of game that Pitt can build on, um, and it really benefits them moving forward even outside of the result because they faced a team that you know is willing to go to battle and knock it around a little bit. Um, the Panthers responded. They kept doing their thing. Um, didn't affect their ability really on either end of the floor for the most part. Um, and I think it'll be a val valuable experience uh, as the season comes to a close. Yeah, absolutely. I thought uh, they delivered as many blows as they got. You know, they definitely took took some hits early, and I think it took them a while to really adjust to the uh, the mood of the game, the physicality of the game, the pace of the game, because it got frantic at some points. It got frantic, and it definitely sped Pitt up, and that I think is what led to you know five turnovers in the first I want to say five five and a half minutes. Um, you know, Pitt looked a little sloppy, uh, even though they were winning, and they did eventually clean things up. You got to give a lot of credit to Jalen Lowe, ten assists to just two turnovers against that kind of pressure. I mean, and you mentioned the length. This is a Florida State team that, uh, for as long really as Leonard Hamilton has been the head coach there, they have given people trouble with their length. They apply a lot of pressure defensively. Um, they try to. I mean, this is just the type of player that uh, that Leonard Hamilton recruits. He recruits guys with real long arms, real tall guys. Um, he sacrifices a little bit of skill sometimes uh, to get that length so that they can be real strong defensive teams. This is not a real strong defensive team, um, but even against that length, it was really impressive to see not only Lowe, but Carrington as well at, at certain points, even though he dealt with some foul trouble, some turnover issues, navigate that length um, and, and accept, the, accept the physicality, but also deliver some blows, I thought, uh, it was also helpful to have Blake Henson being a bully a little bit down on the block and posting up a little bit. Uh, it helped to have Federico finishing really well around the rim. Uh, and I thought everyone was involved in the rebounding. Um, these are two of the longer, taller teams in all of Division One. I. I mean, I think they're both top 10 in Ken Palm's average length uh, metric. Uh, so it, it was a team, Pitt is a team that was built to to contend with this Florida State team. Um, I think we saw last year Florida State's length uh, really bothered Pitt at times, especially in the loss here at the Peterson Event Center last season. Uh, and, and this was a completely different story. Not only was Pitt ready to meet that challenge, but they knew what they needed to do to meet that challenge. I mean, I think it's one thing to know that physicality is coming. It's another thing to be able to actually match it uh, and to, like you said, answer the uh, answer the bell and, and really – match it but be under control at the same time and not just start hitting guys but but to deliver blows deliver physical blows uh within your control and within uh the flow of the game it was it was not something that I think we've seen Pitt do much this season uh and it's not something that um I don't I, this is not the type of game that Pitt would have I think survived if it was November or if it was December uh even this is a different Pitt team uh, and I think that should give you a little bit of confidence uh, moving forward because they they have proven that they know how to win in a bunch of different ways. You mentioned those that technical foul, the double technical early in the game. I believe it was one of the first uh, handful of possessions. Uh, it was in the first few minutes, but Bub Carrington, he and uh, Jameer Watkins get tied, tangled up a little bit after a dead ball. There's some pushing, there's some shoving as Florida State tries to put some pressure on them. Uh, and, you know, not only does... Bub Carrington getting to Watkins' face. Watkins gives him some words back, but Blake Henson is standing in the background, hyping up the crowd during the uh, during the altercation as officials try to separate them. The Oakland Zoo gets behind him. The entire rest of the crowd get behind gets behind him. Do you like seeing that from Bub? Do you like seeing a little bit of fight, a little bit of fight, a little bit of fire, or would you rather him rein it in, not get that technical, try to uh, be a little bit in more uh, in control, or keep those emotions kind of shoved down uh, in game? No, I absolutely love it. Yeah, I think it's something that you need on a team. I don't mind him being fired up or jawing or anything. Um, you know, he's shown that side of him a couple times this season. Uh, one moment that sticks out to me was against Binghamton super early yeah. in the season, especially against the veteran guard in Samir Torrance. 
um, you know, and he bounced back. He's never going to, you know, uh, back down. Um, he backs it up with his play too. Like, I think it's one thing, um, you know, if a guy is jawing or, you know, constantly going at opposing teams players, but I mean, he, he shows up, you know, he had 12, six and four tonight. He's coming off of two 20 plus point games, uh, in a row. He has the confidence. He has the swagger, uh, much like a guy like Blake Hinson. Um, and you need that on a team. You know, you need personality. You need somebody that's going to get the bench fired up. You need somebody that's going to get the crowd fired up, like you said. Um, and, yeah, you know, I think the only reason it would ever be something that I'd be against is if, you know, it was affecting his play. Like if he was forcing bad shots to try to respond to somebody else on the other team or if he was being irresponsible on defense, being extra physical, picking up bad fouls, technicals or whatever it may be, then it's a different conversation. Um but this is, you know, his personality makes him who he is. You know, I, I really do think uh, it's an important part of him as a player uh, and his role as a team on this team in terms of, you know, their energy, their competitive spirit, their fire, all of that, which Capel has talked about endlessly this season. Um, and so he's a huge factor in that. Um, I think he's told the line very well. I think his, you know, he makes the team what it is because of the edge that he plays with. Um, and it's necessary you know, especially in today's game. So I think it makes him who he is and I hope to see more of it moving forward. And I think we will. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I mean, we spent the top of this show talking about how we love Blake Henson swagger. We love the way that he, he plays the game with energy and emotion. So it'd be extremely hypocritical for me to turn around and say, uh, no, I don't like that from Bub Carrington. I, I, I like that as well. Um, and I think it's better that it happened real early. You know, it happened, uh, first of all, it was double tech. So it didn't actually really, Hurt Pitt in a huge way. I mean, Carrington ended up with four fouls, I believe, in this game. That was a bit tricky having to navigate some of that pressure without him. Uh, you would rather have him on the floor without facing that much foul trouble. But uh, I am glad that it happened early in the game. You know, uh, if this is late in the second half and it's a tight game, or even if it was a you know a, a, a nine or ten point game, I think it got that close in the second half for for the Seminoles. Um, if it had happened in that moment. I, I might have been less inclined to be forgiving about it, but the fact that it happened right off the bat, um, that he was kind of setting the tone per se, uh, the fact that he was, you know, doing doing what I just talked about, responding to physicality and saying uh, and setting the tone in a way that says, hey, look, we're not going to just kind of get pushed over. We're not just going to absorb these blows. Uh, we've got plenty to deliver too. Um, and Jeff Capel said in the post game that he didn't have to say anything to, to Carrington. He said, Stay within yourself, but that was really it. There was no big, you know, scolding or uh, or punishment or anything like that. He didn't even take him off the floor. Um, it, it was just very cut and dry of, all right, you got your one. Let it go. Uh, let's play ball now. Um, and I think it really did play to the Panthers' favor. It really did help them kind of set the tone for a really physical game and a game that uh, really demanded some energy and some emotion. Panthers brought that energy and emotion. They are winners over Florida State. They are, like I said, 20 and 10 in uh, 2010 overall. They're 11 and 8 in ACC play with a stunning loss for uh, Wake Forest to Georgia Tech uh, tonight on a buzzer beater. The Panthers are now in a tie for fourth place with Clemson. Uh, they do lose the tiebreaker to Clemson uh, because of those two head to head losses. So as it stands right now, Pitt would hold the fifth seed. In the coming ACC tournament, they would face the winner of uh, – this is where they stood last year. I'm sorry, i got to do some quick math. we got to find the uh, – they would play the winner of Georgia Tech and Boston College. They would play in the first round on Tuesday, and then Pitt would get the winner of that game in the second round. Now, Pitt still can uh, climb to as high as potentially the third seed in the ACC. Virginia is only one game up on them and Clemson. Uh, but they could also fall back into the seventh seed as well. Uh, I want to ask about that third seed, I mean, and that fourth seed as well. I mean, do you think it's worth it for Pitt to try to climb up into that double buy territory? Or do you think it's more useful to play on that second day of the tournament, get another game against a team that you have already beaten or uh, a team that's maybe a little weaker than a Virginia or a Wake Forest or whoever you might play in that next round? Uh, who do you think, uh, where do you kind of fall? Is that extra win? more valuable than uh, maybe a closer shot or a better shot at the ACC championship. Yeah, it's, it's a tough debate for sure, just because, you know, if they do beat NC state, um, you know, and they move up the bubble, they get closer to the cut line, all that stuff. 
it really comes down to, you know, if the selection committee thinks they need one or two more wins in the ACC tournament. And of course, we're not going to know, you know, how one or two wins affects their resume uh, until selection Sunday. Um, you know, I think the double buy sounds good in principle for sure. Obviously, you get one step closer to winning the ACC, um, you know, and earning the auto bid. But I do think when it comes down to it, the single buy is probably the best path. Um you know, because I think, like you said, if they're the number five seed and things hold, Georgia Tech and Boston College uh, play each other, Pitt gets the winner. Those are two teams that Pitt has beat this year. Um, you know, and I think that that gets you a nice little resume boost. And then you would go on to face a team like Clemson or UVA, uh, who I think Pitt could compete with. They obviously beat Virginia, lost twice to Clemson. Um, or as opposed to the double bye, you're pretty much jumping right into a matchup with a team like Virginia, Clemson or Syracuse who swept them. Um, and I think losing in your first game of the ACC tournament just is not going to reflect super well on you. So, you know, I think you could, have, of course, talk yourself into the double by being positive for Pitt, um, you know, climbing up to that number three or number four spot, which was made more possible also with Clemson being beating Syracuse tonight, um, you know, kept that path alive. So, yeah, I would lean towards the single by being, uh, you know, a more positive development for Pitt's. NCAA tournament hopes for sure. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I definitely think it helps the NCAA tournament odds. I really can't argue with your logic at all. But man, I watched this team play, and I, I, I think to myself, why can't they win the ACC? You know, like uh, we talk about those matchups with either a Clemson or a Syracuse, or uh, you know, to a lesser extent, a North Carolina, Duke, or a Virginia. Um, and I, I understand they've been swept by both Syracuse and Clemson, but man, this is a different pit team. Uh, I, I think this would be a different pit team that showed up in Washington, D.C. And uh, I, obviously they're not going to, you know, throw a game at NC State or throw a game against NC State on Saturday. They are going to try to win that game. If I was a betting man, I'd say they would win that game. Uh, but I I, I want to see, I kind of want to see them get there, give themselves the best shot at, at running to the ACC uh, tournament finals. Uh, I, I want to see them, get as close to that championship as possible because I think it, I, I think they can win it. I think this league is wide open. You know, North Carolina hasn't looked as dominant as they did to start the year. Obviously Pitt's beaten Duke. They've beaten Virginia. And, and like I said, I think this is just a pit different pit team. And I don't think they would lose three times in a season to either Syracuse or Clemson. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm a victim of the moment, but I, I feel like that, uh, that, that double by that, that easier path probably, potentially, you know, getting multiple days off close to a week off. I, I want to say I about five days off uh, or four or five days off uh, in between their last game of the regular season and the, and the start of their ACC tournament run. I think that'd be valuable. I would love to see them uh, try to climb as high as possible. Um, and, and I want to see them take a shot at the NCAA tour, uh, the ACC championship. All that said, I do agree with you. I think if you're just thinking about the cold, hard facts of, all right, let's. What's given us the best chance to get into the NCAA tournament? That single by getting that one extra win, the the chance to go into uh go into selection Sunday with as many as twenty two uh, wins, assuming that uh, you know they'd get one and lose the other like they did last year. Um, you know, I think I, I think that's pretty appealing. Uh, if you're if you're the Pitt Panthers thinking solely about uh, their odds of making the NCAA tournament. Speaking of the NCAA tournament, do you feel any different about the Panthers? Uh, after this win, do you feel like they're a lock yet to, to make the NCAA tournament, or do they still have work to do? Obviously, I feel like you, you got to win at NC State, but uh, assuming that they beat NC State, uh, what do you feel like they, they would have to do in the ACC tournament? Yeah, I definitely think there's still a little bit more work to be done. Um, Joe Lenardi released his latest projections tonight. He didn't move Pitt up uh, from the number six team out, uh, number two in the next four out. Wake Forest did drop out. Uh, St. John's moved into the field. So I think a move or a win against NC State probably moves you into the first four out. Um, and I do think just one win in the ACC tournament could put them in the field. I feel like if those two things happen, two more wins than they lose in the quarterfinals like they did last year. Uh, you're probably in a similar situation resume wise, just feeling wise, um, uh, confidence level of making the field as you were with last year's team. Whereas I think three more wins, two wins in the ACC tournament 
on winning against NC State, I feel like probably pushes you towards being a lock. Um, I could see them being a lock with, you know, the right things happening, just winning two more games. Um, but I think just the bottom line is that they do need have more work to be done. I do think they're going to need to go into Washington, D.C. and come away with at least a win in order to feel good about their chances. I 100% agree. I think, uh, you know, two wins, two more wins to close out this season before Selection Sunday gives you gives you a chance. You need some other teams on the bubble to lose after that. I think three wins and you are as close to a lock as possible. I think you might even put yourself in a territory to be out of that that first four out of that playing game, quite honestly. If you win if you win three games to close the regular season and one of them is against uh, you know, a Duke, a Virginia, a, a North Carolina, someone like that. Um, I think that's entirely possible, entirely reasonable. You only win two games and I think you're leaving too much up to chance. You're taking too much stuff out of your hands. So uh, you know, it's a complicated situation. It's fluid. Like you said, there's so much changing on the bubble with every day. But I think the one consistent thing is that Pitt continues to rise. Uh, Pitt continues to avoid those bad losses that a lot of other teams, like you mentioned, Wake Forest, uh, has suffered tonight. Um, and I think that's really doing Pitt a huge service as they look uh, at a dwindling, at a closing window in the NCAA tournament bubble. And you see a bunch of teams dropping off the bubble with some bad losses. So certainly a ton to monitor. Uh, over this last uh, half week of the season and into uh, champ week and the round of conference tournaments, uh, a lot of which have already started. We got the A Sun. We've got uh, the Atlantic 10 starting soon as well. Uh, there was another one that starts tonight. I think it was the Horizon League started tonight too. So uh, it is already March. It is already madness. And uh, the Pit Panthers are right in the thick of it. With that, we're going to head out of here. Thank you all so much for tuning in to another Inside Pit Post Game Report. My name is Stephen Thompson here with my partner, Jack Markowski, thank you all for tuning in. Make sure to like this video, subscribe to us on YouTube, youtube.com slash ad inside the Panthers, and follow all of our reporting at insidethepanthers.com. Appreciate you all tuning in, and we'll see you next time.